Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining uh, today's webinar hosted by Latitude Ventures. My name is Kenny Blanco, general partner of Latitude Ventures, a $100 million venture fund which invests in the most entrepreneurial growth cohort in the country. Our fund invests in pre seed to Series A companies found and led by US Latinos. Our initial checks range from $750,000 to $2 million. And although we invest across industries, we lean towards companies that leverage technology to scale and that fit well within our respective team expertise, which includes technology, financial services, consumer products, re and real estate, to name a few. I'm joined today by my esteemed colleague, uh, Oscar Munoz, uh, general partner of Latitude Ventures and our first LP, actually. Oscar is also the former CEO and, and chairman of United Airlines. He brings a wealth of industry knowledge and expertise to our firm, which includes boards of director, uh, board of directors experience and insight. Oscar, welcome to our webinar and thanks for joining. Thanks, Kenny. Uh, well, I'm excited to be here and uh, very happy to share information. I, I know obviously I've had a lot of experience with boards. I'm currently with Salesforce, which is going through a lot. CBRE, Archer, which is a startup in the electrical vertical takeoff and landing of uh, uh, flying car, basically Jetsons, uh, Fidelity, which you know, Univision and the media business. And uh, of course on CSX and United, when I ran those companies, uh, boards can be complicated, uh, but they can be productive. And there are many, many lessons to be learned. And uh, as part of the venture fund, we're seeing lots of founders, like a lot of you on, on this call, who have put together boards in, in various shapes and ways and manners. And uh, there's a lot of lessons to be learned from the bigger boards that I sit on experience-wise, but there's also a lot of pitfalls. And I think uh, Kenny and the team have done a wonderful job of outlining a really good uh, outline of things for you to consider. And I'll pipe in and add some color wherever I can. And of course, we'll leave some time for questions and answers. Oh, fantastic. Okay, good. Well, thank you. Thank you, Oscar. So for to summarize today's webinar, you know what we hope to cover are board structures, selecting your board, fiduciary duties, and, and best practices. We're, we're going to try to leave 10 to 15 minutes at the end for Q&A. Uh, that said, to, to make this web webinar as informative as possible, we've put together a few slides that we'd like to cover to, as a pretext and to add some structure to, uh, to the discussion. So let me load those up. Sorry about that. All right, good. So as a general point, the activity of boards really begins to matter when you raise outside capital or put differently when you have shareholders outside of the founding team uh, because the board has powers and because they have powers, they also have potential liabilities. So we'll start with the power and roles of boards and its members uh, and move to, to liabilities next. You know, almost all the startups that we evaluate at Latitude Ventures are formed in Delaware. It doesn't take much to register your, your company. And many times, especially at the early stages, founders simply register with the minimal frameworks needed for them to go out and raise capital. Uh, typically, in the first major price round, a company will update their charter or their articles of incorporation, their bylaws and investor rights, which provides a governance structure that is now legally and contractually binding. These, these agreements give the board meaningful powers. The roles are pretty delineated between a board and a management team. The management team makes all day-to-day -day business decisions as they should. The board, on the other hand, sets major policies. They make strategic decisions. They provide oversight. And uh, to founders, they select and oversee management. In general, as it pertains to voting, each, each director counts in a single vote to establish the majority needed. And with that majority, boards can remove an officer. They can remove a founder, a CEO, a CTO. They can set the value of the company. They can approve or block secondary shares, share sales. They set your equity award plans or your option plans. They also can approve dividends or distributions. And in general, on a statutory basis, boards approve capital raises and primary share sales or investment rounds prior to shareholder ratification. In addition to these, these elements around power, there are protective provisions like investor rights that allow major or lead investors to block sales and major transactions, which are decisions that can be contrary to a founder's desire. 
Major investors can also have anti-dilution protection and liquidation preferences, meaning they get their money first, that can significantly affect common shareholders, especially in capital rounds where there are lower valuations. We call those down rounds. And it's lastly, lastly, it's important to note that board members have access to sensitive information that could damage your company's competitiveness if your IP gets out, or they could damage your balance sheet if uh, information is not properly preserved uh, within the board. Needless to say, who you have on your board can really affect the trajectory of your business, and it can affect the longevity of your management team uh, and how it's compensated. So with this backdrop, uh, Oscar, I'd like to spend a few minutes on the ideal board member profile. Uh, we, I've outlined in this slide what the powers are. You can see how uh, a difference of opinion or view can, can lead to some changes that a founder may not want. So I'd, I'd be curious to hear any of your tips and views on how you select a board member, what you should ask of your board member, and more importantly, how you hold them accountable. Yeah, thanks. This is, I think, probably the most important thing you can take away from this webinar. And I thought Kenny's uh, chart, uh, the headline said it all, but your board members have power and they can remove you and others. And so um, I think often like in a, in a big co public company boards, a CEO no longer chooses his or her board members. There's a governance committee, the structure, they're big giant companies, there's lots of rules. Uh, you you know you search for board members and you can put a, a template out for the kinds of things that you're wanting. I want somebody with financial expertise or marketing expertise or in a specific sector, all of those things. But for all of you as founders who are just getting started, uh, you're looking for money, you're looking for guidance. Um, there are lots of people around you that you know and trust that often know more than you do at this juncture about how board management works. And so you'll pick them. Um, you know, there's an old saying in the land of the blind, the one eyed man is king. Um, you know, to, to Kenny's good points, <laughs> you have to be very careful who you choose. Um, you know, you, you, you need board members that are going to show up and be supportive and be prepared and involved in your business in a positive way. Meaning they, they, they understand you, they understand where you're headed and they're going to get involved and engaged in the conversations. Um, you know, when you're when you're just when you're kind of an early stage company, the, the goals of the company are, are pretty straightforward, right? You, you got to grow your customer base and, and our and our revenues for sure. You got to build the product and the team that supports it. And of course, and this is an important one, you got to manage cash. I think that's one of the things that we see in early companies. You know, you get a couple million dollars, let's say, it's like, oh. Shit, that's a that's a lot of money. I have plenty of time. <laughs> so you need folks. Um, you know, it's a little bit of mom and dad kind of things. You need somebody that's going to be pull you aside and say, "Hey, listen, you got to worry about this. You should you should think about this. Um, help you build plans for the future where you can test your views and ideas." Um, so all of that. I mean, we're we're going through the same process again. But it's you you know you need you need folks on your board that can provide value to you personally and to your organization. And there's a lot of, you know, we'll talk more about these issues later, but there's a lot of pitfalls and conflicts that can come of it. So you have to choose wisely, but above all, at least for this juncture of our webinar and for you, a well, big takeaway, who you pick, what their backdrop is and how they're going to react and support you in times of conflict and times of decisions that can go left or right, I think is a very uh, important part for you to know. And that at some point in time, they can get it so involved that they can remove you as a founder and or some of your leaders along with the other board members. So I think that's the most critical takeaway. Uh, they can be they can be involved. Now at, at, at Latitude, I think what we do that's different than, than most uh, because we have some of this experience, we're always asking, so tell me about your board. Tell me what they bring. Tell me why you're saying that. And they'll say, somebody will say, well, I have so-and-so and he said this or she said that. And our first initial question always is that like, what skin in the game do they have to be giving you this, this direction? It is easy to sit by when you have no stake in the game. Well, you should go left or you should hire that person or you should do that or you should not do that. Um, if they don't have any skin in the game in any way, shape or form, uh, they may be nice and they may be well-intentioned, but I'm telling you when somebody has a, a stake in, in, in your company, they're gonna be much more focused and engaged. So um, as you start out, as you pick new folks, 
do not just, uh, you know, random chance, you know, find people that are friends or people know are friends. You really want to test them out as much as you can and ask a lot of questions. So I'd say advice I'd give Kenny. Good. Well, as a follow up on that, Oscar, you know, one of our differentiators at Latitude Ventures is is the the bench that we have on the partnership and the experience. We we have very senior partners, including yourself, that typically don't, you know, that former founders don't typically engage with. How what how can you how should founders think about a very senior advisor that can join their board as an independent board member, where this advisor may have limited time, but with that time. They can be very effective. Any points or any points of advice on how these founders can manage those types of board members and frankly, when they should be using them? Um, I think the, the wonderful thing I've learned about founders and startup companies is that, including us that, that invest in it, we can always use an advisor that's expert in some of the areas of your business. And so to your question, Kenny, um, if there's a person who you know, who has expertise, who is more senior and really has a meaningful interest and engagement, um, that's the thing. And, and how you gauge the meaningful interest and want to be involved is a critical thing because a lot of people say, oh, sure. Yeah, no, I'll help you. Uh, or yeah, I'll spend some time. But when it comes to real big decisions, uh, they may not be around. Uh, they may be right. too spread too thin. And so, again, Think through when you offer anyone any kind of meaningful engagement in your business. If it's just a casual, you know, get almost platicada about something. Yeah, you know what? That's something you can always ask people for their views. But understand that unless people have a vested interest in you personally and your business that's truly meaningful, those are the people that are going to give you the best advice. And here's how to gauge it. When someone always says everything's fine. Oh, sure. Oscar, that's great. Yeah, sure. Yeah, not good. That's great. Or when the person stops you and says, wait, what did you just say? Are you saying you're going to do this and that? And they say, I don't know if that's a really good idea. Um, that's the kind of thing. You want somebody that's balanced in the direction. It's not just, you know, everybody gets, you know, participation medals kind of thing. Uh, if they're really smart and really care about you, they're going to tell you you're wrong sometimes, or maybe it's not the best direction. So I would look for that. Good. Yeah, no, I, I think one of the things interesting about the fund, our fund and a couple of the companies in our portfolio, Agua Bonita is one of them, Alitron and others, we have former CEOs that are representing us with those companies. And it seems like many times just the timing is right for that, uh, for those CEOs to be very effective and, and involved. So it goes to your point on asking the question up front, do they have the time now to help? And if they do, luckily, and if they're lucky enough to have one of these advisors, uh, it can be very effective. So we'll move on um, to the second dimension of the boards, which is their fiduciary duty and the inherent risks of board memberships. This is, a, this is an important detail, which we've also summarized in slides, but I think this is where we'll have more questions in the Q&A because it's not, there is not one size that fits, that fits all. So we're loading the screen here. All right. So Officers and, and directors, as I mentioned, they have powers, but they're also liable. Uh, and conflicts of interest can be landmines for, for companies. With the existence of outside investors, meaning once you've raised kept funds from someone, both founders and their boards can be legally and personally liable for breaches of fiduciary duty. And we'll put differently, you can be sued for losses and negligence, for example. And in general, there are two basic fiduciary duties. There's duty of care and there's duty of loyalty. Duty of care just requires that directors act on an informed and careful basis, that they're showing good business ju judgment to ultimately maximize shareholder value for all shareholders, as I've said in the past. This duty is hard to breach, unless of course you're being just really grossly negligent on how you run the, the, the business. Then another way of saying it is if no one's paying attention that that can really be a breach of duty, but breach of care rather. Uh, but you tend to not have issues here. The the other the other thing to consider is that um, you can document and you can mitigate the proof of duty of care. Uh, you want to be able to show that your board's informed, they're engaged, they're attentive. So minutes really start mattering here. Uh, good documentation. Good documentation is not just good business practice, but it's imperative to to showing that. Folks were paying attention. Uh, addition to this, you have most Delaware charters mitigate personal liability for breaches of duty 
with the exception of, of negligence. Uh, and they, they mitigate this through things like indemnica indemnifications. And beyond this, companies and the investors that sit on board will purchase director and officer insurance for added protection on the board. So duty of care is pretty straightforward, very hard to get yourself in trouble. But now let's move over to duty of loyalty. Duty of loyalty, on the other hand, requires that directors act in the best interest of the company and all shareholders in good faith. Let me stress all shareholders. This includes Common, which has founders and has employees. Conflicts of interest can really affect the perception of loyalty and fairness and lead to some major, major lawsuits, um, especially when things go awry. Unlike the duty of care, breaches of loyalty cannot be protected. So you are, or, indemnif or indemnified, you are really exposed if you're representing a, an investor on a board or a company, if there is a breach of loyalty because of conflicts that were not properly managed. And this liability can be personal as well. So it's not uncommon also for shareholders to sue a board when a conflict is, is obviously and associated with a loss. And this, this may also require quotes to do a full review of how conflicts were documented and how they were, they were managed. Now, conflicts of interest, again, are not uncommon. And there are some natural ones that you tend to see a lot in early stage companies. For example, directors that represent a fund and they're compensated by that fund, either through their carry or some type of deal by deal uh, performance uh, compensation. These directors are dual fiduciaries. They represent shareholders and they also represent the limited partners of the fund. This is a natural divergence of interest between preferred shareholders, which are the investors and the common shareholders, which are uh, employees and founders. You also have situations where, uh, as you mentioned earlier in, in your in your I I intro, Oscar, where people lean on their personal relationships to find board members. Sometimes they bring family members to the board, or they have uh, family or members or related parties that are part of third party transactions. So if a company is being approached for an acquisition and you have friends and family on both sides, these can be potentially problematic. In general, courts will look at all types of economic and personal relationships that lead to special benefits or adverse outcomes for shareholders. So as a founder, you want to be really clear on where the interests lie and where the connections are prior to, to making large decisions, especially those where a particular shareholder is being, is being adversely affected. They say a lot that you know, with great power comes great responsibility. Founders and investors really need to be careful here because these changes, these, the lack of management of interest can be a nightmare um, in certain scenarios. So, Oscar, with this now that we've outlined this, these diverging interests are pretty common. Uh, you have investors on boards all the time, and it's very hard for one size to fit all here. But how does, how does the management of conflict play into founder selection? How does the management of conflict fit into how boards operate uh, you know, in, a form, in a formal and disciplined way? Yeah, so a couple of things. Uh, first, uh, to recap, you're, and I'm glad you have charts so people can have them to work through because that's important. Um, understand when you select formally a board member, they actually have duties and responsibilities. And I mean, it's like, so they're not being jerks or asking you a bunch of questions just because they want, they actually have duties because again, even though they're protected by a lot of different things, they actually do have a duty to watch for all investors as Kenny said. So it's important. They're not just doing it to be anything that it is, the, it is their current role. Um, in big companies, you know, it's a very different structure and situation again, because you're selecting people that have particular backgrounds uh, and have some experience in different areas. And then, you know, the whole board selects them, not just you as the CEO. In fact, increasingly the CEO doesn't really have, I can't say, you know what, I want Kenny on my board. And then the board says, okay. Uh, and you can have okay. founders of big public companies that can put that, but nom no nominating and governance committees are really in charge of that. The fortunate thing about all of you as startups that are probably on this call is that you have that absolute um, choice. I mean, you have, um, you know, the, 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 the ability to uh, carefully choose these folks is, is an important one 
for you to do. So again, knowing that all of this stuff can happen, uh, conflicts of interest, right? I'm a big investor and you know, you want, and I, I got in it, I'm just making up numbers. I got in at $5 and the stock drops and somebody offers me, you know, the stock drops to $2 and somebody offers us three. I'm in at five. That's a conflict. It's like, well, hell no, I'm not doing anything until we get above five. So no matter what you say, no matter what you do, that understanding, you under having that understanding of where that conflict is. Or if they work for a competitor company or they have too much insight, to Kenny's point, you have insider information. I know small, small startup boards, there's not a lot of oversight. There's not a lot of people watching like they are in big company boards about sharing of confidential data. You know, one of your board members who has a vested interest in something else that they could easily be going, you know, going your way in that regard. And so it, it is, uh, th these conflicts are, are important. One of the questions, Roberto Angulo asked the question, which is, I think all of these are questions are great. You know, he says, can boards always remove a founder? And what if the founder is a majority shareholder, which you are generally, the, the shareholder can remove the board, right? Again, here's a conflict. So I'm one of five board members. Uh, you are one of them and you own 37% of the business or something. And then collectively the rest of us do. And you don't like, you know, you don't like one of your board members because, hey, you missed it and they have a conflict or they're just jerks or they're not really helpful, all of those things. Um, that is a vote and you have 37% of the vote. That's not 100% of the vote. And so you have, you know, in my case, it's three other board members who may or may not agree with you. So, uh, you know, it, 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 same thing, the board has to collectively, what's that, Kenny? Yeah, well, I was going to clarify there. One of the points on the slides is remember that each board member votes it counts as one vote, regardless of ownership. That's how typical board quorums and voting is set. Now you can set it based on ownership as well, which in your case, again, you don't have full protection because you don't have control. But these boards where each board member votes as one, they can remove you regardless of your ownership. Yeah. And so uh, that's, you know, that's a, that's a good, uh, uh, thank you for the question, Roberto, because it's, that's a particular conflict. You know, it's like, I don't, I don't like what someone is doing and I want to get rid of them. Uh, you have to go through all of these folks to do that. So again, if it's back to the repeating mantra that you'll hear, you know, you know, poorly defining or, or understanding well the incentives of your board members, you know, can, can lead to very difficult uh, situations so that you have to make sure you understand it and work through. Good, good. Well, uh, that's a good segue, Oscar, to conflicts. Um, and so what I've done here is put together some, a slide that outlines the conflicts, some, some of the types of conflicts that we, that we commonly see uh, boards face. So you, you touch on a few of these, uh, Oscar, which is great. So different investment horizons. So you have early investors, they may want to see some exits, some realization. Or now, while more recent investors want the company to keep going, common shareholders, they just want maximum value uh, across either scenario. But you can see this is where early investors may have fatigue or where they just had different investment horizons to begin with. Different valuations, founders, may maybe they have some fatigue and they may find offers more attractive in down markets while recent investors want the company to keep going and innovating. A down round, like I mentioned, may give the company some runway, but it'll also dilute the founder significantly. And a founder that that is hyper diluted may lose the interest to keep the company to keep the company going. You have different costs of capital. This is a big one that we talk to our founders uh, about. Venture funds have very high costs of capital. They have very high expected returns. They're they're much higher than a private equity firm or a strategic investor. Having the wrong type of investor for your type of business can be problematic because if you don't, if you want a nice, steady lifestyle business or a business that has even to early, it can uh, can raise debt very early. This may not be the best type of business for 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 a VC, and having that clearly outlined at the beginning is really important. Founders may also not have the same risk tolerance as their investors. If you're a founder that's risk averse or you really don't wanna be um, raising the type of equity that your funds are asking you to raise and acquiring the talent and building the technology, this can be a conflict that can affect the strategic decisions that, are, that the board approves on an ongoing basis. 
cash distributions. Oscar, you and I chatted about this uh, prior to this webinar. A founder may need some money. Uh, and, and in later stages, secondary shares are traded because of the size of the round. A board approves those secondary transactions. They typically, the, fund, the company or the board may, or investors may have rights of first refusal. Uh, and they may want to limit how much cash a founder is taking off the table. If a founder raises a considerable amount of cash for themselves, they, they may become a walkaway risk. Uh, and that, that's a conflict that is inherent between the personal decisions of the founder and, and the investors. And then lastly, you have long-term vision differences. Investors on the board may think that the current CEO or founder just aren't built for the investor's vision of where the company is supposed to go or how far the company is supposed to go. And you may see some investors start taking more of an active approach to, to, to changing the management or bringing in people that they view as vision aligned or loyal. That is a very common, that is a very easy to see conflict and it happens because ultimately you have investors that are on your board. Generally, you, you want to disclose these conflicts and be disciplined about documentation. Documentation is key, but ultimately it's the common shareholders perception, their perspective on the outcome that will that will weigh considerably if there's litigation. And no, all of these things can be, uh, don't have to be nefarious, but it is very, very important that everyone sees them transparently and that the facts are there when a decision is made that does have those types of effects. So, so Oscar, with this, with now with this backdrop, this is where we can have a more fluid discussion. But how do these, how do how do scenarios like these, where you have differing views, affect a company's ability to operate and their strategic direction? I mean, how 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 do you manage a strong-armed board member or a difference that occurs through time? And and again, how can founders, if they don't catch it early, later on manage investors or employees or officers that may want the company to go in one direction uh, versus another. Yeah. Um, again, the repeating mantra of, you know, if you picked wisely, you're, you're going to have an easier chance of this. And so, but let's say you've already picked where you are, you run into these conflicts. Um, th this is, I think, where it's probably the most dangerous and the least experienced a lot of founders tend to be. Because as a founder, you, you, you created something, you've thought of a product, an idea, you, you, you've gained some money for it, you've structured a company and you have these wonderful, clear vision of what you think this can be. And, you know, and we all have a ton of examples, it seems like, of people that you know, are the unicorns in the world and we're gonna be that unicorn. And so you're very focused on your product. You'll always talk about your product in the highest of fashion, the highest form of, of flattery. Um, and you know your your board will tend to be a little bit more down to earth. They they will have more experience generally, and will tend to guide you different ways. So you know these conflicts. Um, the best way to avoid all of this is to get ahead of it as much as you can. If you pick wisely, you're well ahead. If you haven't picked, or people have changed over the course of time, and people will, and you're receiving some of this conflict, it can be very debilitating. In a public company, it's very difficult because. They did, you know, you have a comp committee and the comp committee, you know, person can get very excited about your, you not doing anything and get in the way. In small companies, it tends to be a little bit different uh, in startups, but they can be a pain in the butt and they can, they, you know, they reach out to all the other board members, constantly raise issues about this and that. So the, the, the way to do this, and it's the hardest thing for a lot of you to do, is you, this is where leadership and communication skills are really critically important. Um, because you have to prove your point all the time. You deal with the day-to-day -day management, you have insight into where your product can go. And, and what I always say to people is there's, you know, you're talking about your product. There's no one in the world that knows more about your product than you and your team. And so keep that at top of mind, but don't rely on that. Just because you think it's an awesome product and you think you have a brilliant strategy, um, you have to be able to prove it not with emotion, not with raising your voice. And I see that a lot in the VC world. You know, some people go out and present and they feel when they answer a question, they, they find if it just get louder with the answer or faster with numbers, it doesn't make sense. You have to learn how to communicate in an effective way 
that proves to people that the direction you are taking is based on facts, on data, some research, some experience, any one of those things that says, you know, because again, you have multiple board members and there may be a conflict with one. Uh, they may have a conflict of any of sort, or, or it doesn't matter how, you have to deal with that conflict in a way that's fact-based. Because if I'm one of the other board members and I see one person raising a question and I see you as a founder kind of stumble or not really answer the question or defiantly say, well, it's, you know, it's, you don't, you don't understand that will tend to move me to the other side, whereby when someone asks a question, even that I know it's a, a conflicted, you know, pointed question to try to get you in trouble and you have your collective shit together. Here's why I did this. Here's the process we've gone through. Here's why I understand. Here's, and you have that. I will tend to so want to support you as management and the person that's raising a point. So a way to balance this is, is to always be on top of your game, always know your numbers, always know your product, and talk about it to people in a way. One of the most tire ring things that you all do is you're always pitching your product. You're always trying to get money. You're always trying to get business, right? So you're always pitching that. So refine that to a point where you come across uh, as a really fact-based, thoughtful, an understandable leader, that will tend to do that because those conflicts and all the ones that they mentioned above, you can't get past them without that. Uh, again, avoid them first if possible. And if not, you know, you have to work through facts and data would be my suggestion. Well, thank, thank you, Oscar. I, I think, you know, one of the, the next points that, that I had here for, for us to discuss is around what happens if you do reach an impasse. Let's say that you have to make a hard decision where a founder is going to be diluted because of a down round, because things have not gone as planned. We're, we're seeing, obviously, the market is a, is very, very volatile right now, especially in private markets. And their VCs are not deploying at the same rate as they were before. Cash is becoming very, very scarce, not just within the, the companies, but also around the companies across their investor base. Some of these decisions are, founders are facing these hard decisions now. Uh, and they're also wondering if they are the right fit for these companies. So how do you think about these binary decisions as a board member where maybe the founder doesn't even really know where to go? Because if you have a down round of restructuring, it's not great for them or morale. Or um, if they have to switch, their, take a seat back or take a step down or change a, a co-founder because of a change in a necessary leadership. What are some effective ways that board members can help both preserve culture while making the right decision quickly? Uh, you know, <laughs> this, these are, are, are definitely tough situations. Um, you've all read about Salesforce and we had co-CEOs and the recent change, uh, proxy uh, fights are looming potentially with activist hedge funds. There's a reason why activist hedge funds acquire so much of the, of the stock so they have a voice and they can demand, negotiate or force a situation where they get on the board. And now, again, this whole thing we've been talking about carefully choosing who you have so they can be advisory and supportive and consultative. Um, when you have an activist, their interest is, hey, I saw your stock go down and I want it to go up. And so my goal is gonna be just simply to go there. So these are just tough situations that are throughout. And for all of you, um, when you have, um, when you have these conflicts and you're having these down rounds or the business isn't going along, this is where having uh, a, a board member or an effective person that around you, they can really consult because we, we've seen it a couple of times in our own portfolio where things have not worked out well and we've had to make changes. It is emotional, it is difficult. There is no clear way of doing it. Um, but as you're making decisions and you're working through folks, I, I think you have to do two things. You have to put the survival of the company first and foremost. That is your duty, it's your baby. You wanna do that, but you have to balance that with staying honest about the likelihood of success. Back to my earlier conversation about facts and data, as opposed to emotion and just raising your voice and oh, this is great. A, a, a something for you all to do is to go as many of these conferences that, that have people pitching and, and talking about their products and just forget the product and hear what they say and categorize it. They're all going to talk about how the product came to be, what, what their background is, what the product is, why it fits in all these places, what, you know, the, you know, gosh, I love the TAM one, right? 
it's the total available market is $17,100 billion. <laughs> yeah. And we only want 1% subsidy. But if you think about what, what you're hearing from someone else is exactly what you're saying. Investors, board members are hearing the same thing from so many different people. When you're pitching people for money, they have spent their entire last year listening to pitches that all sound the same. Differentiate your approach in some way, shape, or form. Provide facts and data that are, are, are aware and make me think differently. And, and try to distance yourself in as many ways as possible from the, the pack that's always saying this. And again, the survival of your product and your company is, is awesome. And that's what you want to do. But you also have to be honest about yourself, about where you are, where your money is. And, uh, and again, and, and, and back to the, the competency and quality of your board and the kind of the mom and dad sort of thing that I, like mom and dad can be a pain in the butt sometimes for all of us, <laughs> but we love them. And above all, what you always know by and large is they love you. And therefore what they say, however misguided, however misarticulated right. or misdirected, they have nothing else in mind. I tell this to my kids all about their mom <laughs> because they love me, of course, no. But it's like, no one loves you more. No one cares for you more. And so have that person. But but the, the other, there's a divining rod at some point in time where you have to be honest about your capabilities and you know, I'll call it what it is, but fight for the survival of your company. And that's a, a delicate balance for you to do. I find that facts and data are much more helpful than emotion because people will not put money towards emotion. You know, they just, they just won't. It's the nature of the beast in the world of money. Man, no, this is great, Oscar. I, I, I mean, I, we're getting a bunch of questions here. So clearly uh, the folks have found the discussion to be helpful. So we'll switch to some questions and then we'll close it up. Thanks again, Oscar, for, for your insight and wisdom. Um, and really giving us a perspective that it's very hard to find these days because of how few uh, people are, are in the seats that you're in. Uh, yeah. All right. So we'll go I, I, well, can you, uh, as we go to questions, because I have them in front of me as well. Um, listen, again, it, we can talk about these things till we're blue in the face. The examples may or may not work for you. I think above all, Kenny's opening slide that, you know, board members do have authority and power at various levels at various different times. And they can make things happen for the good and for the bad. And, and you know, there's a lot of, you know, I think a lot of the questions that I see here, it's like, how, you know, Fanny starts with and a couple others have also, um, how do you determine when you should establish a board for your startup? So that's an interesting question that I actually I have for you, Kenny. I mean, I may, uh, you probably have a good answer for that because, yeah. you know, as a as big pu public company, the boards have been in place once you went public and you have to by law and rule. When you're not public, but you have people's money, it's probably a different yep. approach. So. Your thoughts would be great here. Yeah, the, the the as soon as you are out fundraising or you've started raising capital or you're issuing shares to employees, that's when you want to build your start your formalize your board because you want to have governance. So it's it's really when you're starting to engage with outside parties, formalizing these things are expensive. You want to do them the right way. We, uh, I, I'd like to give a shout out to Wilson Cincini, which uh, you know made sure that I was honest in the the fact that I shared. But working with an established and knowledgeable venture law firm to get the docs right the first time is really important. So it's okay to wait, but as soon as you're raising money, is when you need to establish these documents and the documentation associated with board activity. Uh, but Look, if you don't aren't going to raise money for a while, your pre-seed, you can contractually set up these uh, arrangements to where you have almost what would be a formal board. Those aren't bad things to have. The one caveat I'd add, though, is that you got to be clear with those that are joining the company at the pre-seed that they're not going to be there forever. That really, when you raise capital, you're going to reassess the entire board because you're going to have a lead investor that is almost certainly going to be on your board and um, and not every advisor can stick around forever. So that's the answer to the first question. And maybe Oscar, I can kick off the second one to you, which is giving giving concrete examples. So Santiago asked about, about concrete examples yeah. of board members that go above and beyond. Yeah, so that, that's a perfect, I, I, I have a really good example um, and many again in large companies, but no, I have a startup, it's called Archer. They are uh, this flying car, Jetsons sort of thing. And uh, they went, there was a SPAC vehicle. So we, 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 we went live at, at $10, raised almost a billion dollars of cash. And <laughs> yeah, right? 
And then <laughs> SPACs just took a beating and, and we hover between two and $4 at different times. And the flow is not great because it's concentrated owner. You got all sorts of things that we're having to worry about. And so in, in trying to put a board together to support this, what is critical for that product? Well, we need federal airline authority, uh, airport, airline authority, FAA authority to get this thing in the air. And they're all about safety. They're all about, hey, you want to have a flying car? You know, how is it not going to crash into people and, 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 you know, and injure folks? And so we have people from NASA we have that that uh, have you know the technology behind all of this is something there. They've done this uh, both both the tech and the hardware space. We have a a, a car manufacturing person of a, a senior level that that made automobiles all over the world, so understands the concept of of automation of automated driving or um, autonomous driving. I'm sorry. And so when we look for people, we look we're a, we're a SPAC, and we initially we have lots of share owners out there. So we find a person who took a lot of SPACs public and is now not doing that, but he has lots of insight into those things. And that's how we went and found all of those folks because we had very specific needs and examples. And so when you ask about where do people go above and beyond, I mean, it's like, you know, that we, we hired somebody from the FAA that, that retired from there. Well, he knows everybody inside the FAA, FAA. So when we go, he comes with us or he comes, he goes with the team. And it's like, he's, he, he, the company is sitting there talking to strangers, but he's talking to friends or acquaintances and knows what they're going to ask and knows who they are. And that gives us a sense of credibility. Uh, I have, boy, I have brought on former senators, uh, you know, former <laughs> leaders in Congress because you have, you know, in the airline space that I would do, we constantly have issues out there that we need to know the, the, the lay of the land. Um, so, you know, the, the concept of somebody adding value is, is uh, so many lines along that way because they can, you know, people with a specific expertise or former or current engagement level, I think is a really important thing to have. So uh, again, find them and you can use them and say, you know, the question is how do you find such members? Yes. And, it, and, and also difficult? how do you find, and how do you find that those candidates with that talent that are Latina or Latino, you know, you're one of the few Oscar uh, and that is changing. But I'm sure you're called all the time. So how? Yeah. So how Rosa Maria Hernandez that? asked that question. Um, you know, it, it, and it's not easy. So um, because you know we're all startups, and we, we know we need th this is a particular um, area where I think our community can really help itself because we can find people. Okay, they're not all going to be past CEOs because unfortunately we don't have a whole bunch of them. You know, um, there's probably a handful of Latino C people that have been CEOs and, and companies, um, but you can find people that have been head of technology, right? We all know in our community, people that have been out there do that. That's where you find that, that thing. And you're doing two things. You're getting some expertise in a world that you want uh, and need, but you're also building the resume of a Latina, fellow Latino or Latina right. that when they are asked, do you have board experiences? Like, yes, I do. Um, I, you know, I work for these, you know, to startups and everything. And. And so, you know, it, it is saying that there isn't, there isn't anybody out there is right. becoming increasingly kind of a bullshit answer for big right. boards, right? This is where Saul Trujillo and I spent a lot of time trying to get big boards to understand uh, that there are people out there. And what I always suggest to big company boards is that you don't need to, like, I joined the board of Continental Airlines at a very early age. Um, and I joined a board that was filled with really senior experienced people. And so they didn't need anything. They needed a financial right. expert. And I was a CFO uh, and I happened to, you know, I, and I happened to be in transportation. So I fit some of their categories, but I had lots of time and lots of people inside the board already to be able to advise me and counsel me. Now, in today's, you know, even in today's world, somebody that that was as young as I was, in a different industry, I wouldn't get picked as a board just because I didn't have the experience. They were able to take the chance. And by the way, I just right. happened to be Latino. So there's a lot <laughs> of different ways of that, so. Yeah, I, I think it's an interesting one because I feel like there are a lot of Latinos out there doing really well in industry, but they just haven't really put their hand up. And I know that there are Latino organizations trying to reach out or find those folks or give them a, an opportunity to, to reach out. But even with people like yourself that are on boards, not that I'm asking everyone to contact you, but what what are ways that that folks can put their hand up? Is it should they reach out to companies directly? Should they start with startups? 
Should they reach to the, out to their network to see how to get exposure? What are some tricks and tips? So Kenny, this is for someone wanting to be a board member? Yes. Of a large public so company look, or a startup? Of, of a couple, well, at first at a startup, you would think that they would start a startup, but they maybe they're good enough to be on a corporate board. Yeah. Um, what here's I'll tell you what you don't do. So it's a difficult question because there's everybody asks that and there's no um, the you you don't reach out on your own to someone. <laughs> it's kind of like you don't reach, you know, it's like it, it's it, it can seem desperate and companies, big companies use these search firms. And and so what you want to do is, first of all, accomplish enough in your personal career where it warrants attention and it screams experience and knowledge, right? It's like, okay, wow, this person has done all of this. I, I, I need that expertise and value. So don't just think because you're Latino or Latina or you start a company that people are gonna recognize you. Build a resume that does that. And so elevate yourself to a point where people around you, if somebody is asked, it's like, hey, I'm looking for a board member. It's like, hey, have you talked to you know Jose over here? Sorry, that's so racist to me to just use Jose. <laughs> but we ought to, uh, we use, like Jose is on my, well, my uh, Castaneda is my next, is the next uh, answer question. So that's what I, yeah. but again, elevate yourself to a point where you can do that. Um, you can't really reach out to folks. What I always tell folks is, again, you've all heard this before about networking. Reach out to the people that you know that are more senior, have more knowledge and say, hey, you know, whoever you are, um, I am in this stage of my life. I, I would love to be considered. I know it's not an easy thing, but I'm just letting you know that I'm available and I'm yeah. accomplished. And, and here's the three areas where I think I bring a lot of expertise. You know, I'm a tech person. I'm a finance person. And, and uh, I, you know, you know it's just, in your travels, if you ever get, so let people know you're available in that regard. And there's no pressure there. Like, hey, can you help me get on a board is a really pressing thing for someone to ask because it's just not that easy to do. But right. if I know you're available, you never know when a conversation is going to happen at a cocktail function or on a plane or something that you can do that. So that's the way I would do that. Good. No, thank you, Oscar. One of the questions that I see, the other ones are tenure. So in public boards, you see some folks that maybe overstay their welcome. And as I mentioned earlier, early board members may not stick around much because once the board is formalized, investors really tend to take seats. So how do you think about tenure? How do you think about when it's a good time to, to switch a board member. Obviously you talked about aligning expertise with the stage of a company, but uh, sometimes boards can get sleepy. So I'm, I am curious to hear how you think about tenure and, and staying too long or not being there long enough. Um, so it, it's a big movement in corporate America with the SEC and others to have limitations and, 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 and tenure guidelines for board members. Um, you know, I, I'll use Salesforce because it's a perfect example and it's very public. Uh, the majority of board members have been have been there for the entire length of Salesforce's evolution. So they wow. wonderful, right? <laughs> they, they've known the company from zero to where they are now. And so they know the history, they know the people. Um, but we know we've had a couple of folks that are over 20 years on that board. Yeah. And so today's view of life is that's way too long. You're too cozy. You know the people too well. You're never going to make a tough decision against somebody because you know they become your friends over the years and such. So that's the going rate. So uh, companies are being asked to put uh, tenure, like a, an age limit or a time limit. Uh, Fifteen years seems to be seventy-two to seventy-five seems to be that. So that is the way people normally roll off boards. Your question is more. Well, how do you get rid of a board if they're not working out? <laughs> or it's just, you know, yeah. you know, it's like, hey, they, they were great for the startup. I had, I had, I had, I needed someone at the FAA, for instance, in my example of Archer, yeah. but FAA has already approved us. We're up and flying. And, you know, all of a sudden he or she's not really being able to add any value. Um, and I think that's when, you know, you elect a, a board chairman or a lead director and he or she is the one that you ask. It's like, hey, Oscar seems to be a little sleepy and his value from his airline days, you know, is, is a little dated and, you know, he, he misses a lot of our meeting or whatever it is that might be that's a yeah. concern. And then you have to have an honest discussion. A lot of people, you know, normal people will say, you know what, you're right. It's time for me to step away. Um, now, remember, in big boards, you get compensated pretty decently. You get stock, you get cash, all of those things. Right. Small boards like you, I don't think there's a lot of financial, uh, you know, you're not paying them. Uh, 
any Correct. cash usually. Yep. They may have equity to some degree in small portions, which they probably do, or they're an investor in a large way. So I, I just it's a it's one of those things where it, it's difficult to answer specifically. But um, in a big board, when you want to get rid of a board member, the board has to vote. And it may have to say, you know, okay, Oscar's not wanting to go. Yeah. We, you know, we need him to go to make room. And so the board will, you know, you know, meet privately and say, now, uh, one of the things is how you hold people accountable in some of these things. What big boards do, and you can do a little bit of this one, is you have internal surveys and you have internal feedback where, you know, the lead director that you choose sits with every one of the board members every year. It's like, hey, we always talk about the company. We always talk about our founders and where they're going. How you doing, as Joey would say. Um, and, and and you have honest conversation between humans because right. boards boards have to coalesce and bond and work together in order to help you as a founder. So you facilitate that, but you can also put a little bit of accountability just like anyone else. It's like, you know, how are we doing as a board? How is, how is every individual board member can do it? So there's lots of different surveys and mechanisms for feedback that can be done over time. But just getting rid of a board member because you don't like them. That's back to the main, main issue. How you pick, yeah. you know, boards have a lot of authority. They have to vote on this and it's not just your vote. Um, and again, as, as primary owner, um, you, know, you know, in one of my companies, we had co-founders at another company, we, we had co-founders and, uh, you know, between them both, the two founders, they own 70% of the company. And right. for a lot of different reasons, we make a decision to remove the co-founder, co-CEO stat and have one. So we have to ask one of them to leave. Again, 70% uh, plus, so 35% a piece, right? Or a little bit more than that. How do you do that? Well, the board right. has to involve themselves, get it, get, you know, get, do the process, go through the things, and then have to figure out a way to not dilute the company by the person that's, that owns still a significant portion of the company. He's not on the board, he's not in the company, but he's a right. big share owner and can sell stock and, and, and kill the flow and do all those different things. So it's not an easy process, but um, you just can't get rid of them by yourself. It has to be a process. One of the things I wanted to ask you about, because we talked we talked a lot about loyalty, and then we'll wrap up uh, we'll wrap up with this one. Uh, it's been great to to touch on all these questions, and hopefully we can share out, share these slides with everyone that's been on the board or been on the webinar. But you know, Oscar, when it comes to disclosing a conflict, sometimes a board member may need to recuse themselves from a board vote if they are an investor leading that round or if they are an investor on the other side of an acquisition. How, how do you think about just disclosing conflicts? Are you of the belief, look, disclose, 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 uh, and be as, as over-communicate even things that could potentially be viewed as a conflict or, and then recusing yourself? Obviously you could have, you could recuse yourself out of everything in that case. Or, or the other extreme is not, which can get you into trouble. So I wanted to just get kind of your quick tips on how you think about disclosing personal yeah, business. Yeah, so again, in big company boards, you have a DNO question, director and officer questionnaire. And they ask you, like, <clears throat> it's grown. I, it takes an hour to fill <laughs> out this thing. Do you or any of your family member have any interest in, and you got to go through all of this. So the company has asked the question, you've responded, um, and then that's filed. And if you lie there, you as, a, as an individual board member are more liable for that. And so that's the way big companies do it. How you do it in smaller companies where, you know, a lot of, a lot of the people that give you money are, are broad investors in a lot of different areas. And they may even be competitive at some point in times. Um, and so you have to kind of rely on people's knowledge uh, and conflict. But I think uh, you should put a practice after you get a pretty developed board to kind of ask, you know, form your own simple questionnaire about conflict. You know, do you have any interest in something that would interfere with your thing? And it's just and asking the question, um, you know, but uh, there's a lot of things. There's a couple of questions here real quickly that we have a few minutes. Yeah. Wouldn't a board, uh, Will Salcedo, wouldn't a board question your focus if you join a board of another company when you're busy? Yeah, most CEOs, like I had a limit of two when I ran United that I could be outside oh, and I didn't do two. Um, I didn't do one. I did none because... I just, I, you know, it was my own, I want to focus here. Um, I think board members, as they get a little more tenured, will join another board, but usually one is the max. And so, yes, boards very much uh, question that because it's like, how can you be doing? So now I was a public company CFO and had the board seat with uh, Continental slash United Airlines. 
So that that was manageable. That went to the board for approval. Um, I probably mm -hmm. could have had another one if I wanted to, but then it begins to question. It's like, hey, where do you work here or there? Because board enrollment is is a lot. So um, then Alex Garcia asked, can you recommend any books or resources? Well, just matter of hap, I just happen to have written a book. <laughs> I'm, kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. There's a Alex. There's a lot of uh, books out there and resources. Um, books that are academically written tend to be more hypothetical. Um, whatever you read and develop, you should think about the person that's writing it, what experience they actually have in doing that. And then, and then whatever you read is somebody's opinion and view um, and, and not necessarily always the thing you should follow, right? I always tell people, it's like, don't go read a book on leadership over the weekend and come in on Monday and like, you're gonna be that, you know, fifth dimension leader or something. It just doesn't work that way. Books, insights, guidance, opinions are just ways to guide yourself. You have to read them, you have to accept them and form your own opinion and your own course of direction rather than what somebody wrote for something else. I just, I'd be, I'd be wary of, there's no one way of doing any of this stuff. No, this is good. And, and we'll share a book that uh, it's called Startup Boards, A Field to Building and Leading an Effective Board. That's a good one if, if you're interested in boards. But and of course, so, uh, Oscar, when your when your book comes out, we're, we're looking forward to to reading it and sharing it with everyone. So thank you for that. Well, let's wrap up here. We we only have a few minutes. I do want to just plug our firm, um, given our mission, but also this is this thought leadership and and information we hope really helps founders. Please follow us on LinkedIn, Latitude Ventures on LinkedIn and Twitter. Also, if you're a founder, come go to our website. We have a a submission form where we can get to learn look, learn about your business and consider a potential investment. And as I said, think about uh, elite or very good venture capital law firms like Wilson, Wilson Cincini uh, to help you formalize your documents and ensure that you have the right, the right governance. With that, thank you, everyone. And Oscar, I'll let you close us out. Uh, thank you, everybody. Appreciate it and look forward to meeting, seeing you. And always, we are here again. Remember, it, it's a it's a Latino thing, and we want to help as much as we can. And between myself, all other partners of us, we are always here to help in whatever way. So ask away, and we'll try to help. Thanks, everyone.